My name is Mike Gaben and welcome to my KSP campaign. In the last episode, Chrissy Kerman became our first Kerbal to walk on the moon. And we concluded that episode with the crew of the Korion uh, on their way back to Kerbin. But I thought in the meantime I could get another mission out of the way. And what you see here is Interplanetary Relay 1. Uh, coming off of the launch pad and uh, I'll talk about this mission in just a little bit but I do want to point out that I do have a bit of a different lifter uh, I made this uh, use that tri coupler made a lifter out of strapping a bunch of 1.25 meter engines together in fact this used to be a lifter I used to build all the time but now that tri coupler is much later in the tech tree than it used to be but I do like these um, single stage lifters for getting satellites into orbit Anyway, uh, I actually have two missions for this particular spacecraft, it's this satellite. One is a remote tech contract to point an antenna at uh, one of the inner planets, either uh, Moho or Eve or Duna, I think, maybe Dras, I don't know, but, but, but anyway, pointing at one of those, so that should be easy enough, and this thing has an antenna that uh, is equipped to do that. And uh, the other contract is to put a satellite into a geostationary or geostationary orbit um, over a specific point pilot's voyage there's a waypoint on the surface of Kerbin that I need to place the satellite over and I'll get into geostationary orbits in just a little bit but why don't we take a look at our antenna this is the Reflectron KR7 that comes with the remote tech mod it has a range of 90 megameters and it should seem like a simple enough contract, just as it sounds like from the contract, all i got to do is point it at one of these inner bodies. Okay, so let's see here. Let's try Duna. Duna. Oh, no, contract didn't go green. Let's see if we can expand this out here and get a better look at what's going on. Oh. No, it's, it's stuff still in red. Bouncing around a bit and in red. Um. Okay. Well, let's let's try Eve here. Nope. Eve's not working. Okay. Still not green. I see in red there. It says out of range. That's weird. Moho. Okay. Now those of you <laughs> that know their metric prefixes at least better than I did at the time I was performing this mission. I must have been just sleepy or dopey or what. Um, might have already figured out what's going on here. Um, but me at this time, I hadn't. I was confused. I thought, oh, well, maybe all of those planets are just, you know, on the on the other side of Kerbin. Maybe Kerbin's blocking the signal. So uh, I put it on hold and said, ah, I'll try it once I'm out there in my geostationary orbit. So... Uh, <laughs> I'll explain it later what's going on, but uh, probably a lot of you have already figured it out, probably well before I did. So uh, why don't we talk about geostationary orbits? A geostationary orbit is an orbit where the object orbiting, the satellite in this case, is going to remain over a fixed point over Kerbin. And that fixed point is this pilot's voyage, which is a waypoint here on Kerbin. I need to get the satellite to get over that point and to remain on top of that point. Now the way that is accomplished is by putting the satellite into an orbit that has a period that is equal to the rotational period of Kerbin, which is six hours. So I need to get into an orbit that is has a period of six hours. Now a circular orbit with an altitude of 2,868.75 kilometers has a period of pretty much six hours. And uh, the contract has actually put that period for us out there in green. So that's simple enough. We've done tons of orbital transfers before. No problem. But that's only part of what we need to accomplish. The other part is that we need the satellite to finish in a position that is pretty much over. It gives you some leeway, but over pilot's voyage, the uh, waypoint that's on Kerbin's surface. So here's how we're going to accomplish that. The first part of that is to find out what the longitude of pilot's voyage is. And I'm going to do that by uh, using Kerbal Engineer and uh, Waypoint Manager in combination with each other. I'm going to time warp to the point where I am directly above the waypoint, and then I'm just going to look at Kerbal Engineer, and it's going to, and it's telling me here 
that my longitude is 161 degrees west. Okay, that's the first piece of information that I need. The next thing I need to know is how long is it going to take to do the home end transfer out to my required altitude? Uh, and thankfully, that's an easy thing to figure out as well. All I have to do is set up a maneuver node, uh, you know, uh, set up the prograde on the maneuver node to the point where uh, my apoapsis is where I need it to be. Again, that 2,868.75 kilometers, and yeah, there we go, that, that, that's going to be close enough, and you can see here that it's going to take an hour and uh, 26 minutes to get out to, to, before I'm out to, uh, to my apoapsis. Don't forget, though, I also have to take into account when the maneuver node, I'm three minutes away from the maneuver node, so the actual transfer will take an hour and 23 minutes, or uh, 83 minutes. Okay, now, what does that information give me? Well, of course, while I'm going out to, uh, to my apoapsis, while I'm doing the Hohmann transfer, which is going to take 83 minutes, a Kerbin, of course, is rotating. So I need to figure out what angle is Kerbin going to rotate through in that amount of time. Well, actually, that turns out to be pretty easy because Kerbin's period is 6 hours. And 6 hours times 60 minutes is... 360 minutes. So it, Kerbin takes 360 minutes to do a complete rotation. Well, turns out complete rotation is also 360 degrees. So in other words, Kerbin rotates through one degree every minute. All right, so let's put all this information together. At the apoapsis of my home and transfer, when I get there, I want to be directly above pilot's voyage, which is at a longitude of 161 degrees west. Of course, I don't, you know, in order to get the apoapsis to be at that longitude, I gotta, I gotta be at the opposite side of the planet um, when I go to do my burn. So the opposite of 161 degrees west, if you subtract 180 degrees from that, is 19 degrees east. Okay, however, it's going to take me 83 minutes to get out to do that transfer to get out there towards apoapsis, in which time Kerbin will rotate 83 degrees. So that means I need to do my burn a further 83 degrees uh, towards the east, right, because of the direction in which Kerbin rotates. So I'm not going to burn at 19 degrees east longitude, I want to burn at 102 degrees east longitude. Okay. If I burn at 102 degrees east longitude, then by the time I get out to apoapsis of my transfer burn, uh, pilot's voyage, that waypoint should be right below me. And I'm coming up to 102 degrees east, well, just about now. And as you can see, I'm not using a maneuver node for this. I deleted that earlier maneuver node. That was just there for timing. Um, I'm just watching my apoapsis go up, and when it gets to uh, 2,868.75 kilometers or thereabouts, I'm just going to cut my throttle and ride on up there. And as we're performing this burn, I just want to mention that as of this narration, uh, 1.05 has just been released, and I haven't had a chance to take a look at it yet. I'm, I'm very excited about it. I'm going to wait for some mods to uh, play a little bit of catch-up, make sure the compatibility is there. Definitely looks like some uh, airplane, a lot of airplane goodness added into the mix, which is great. Uh, also, some thermodynamic fixes and other things that I'm not, I, I, I'm not going to get into here. I want to kind of discover them for myself anyway. But uh, this, of course, is still 1.04. I'll let you know when I go up to 1.05, but it won't be for a little bit just yet. But anyway, uh, once the burn is complete, of course, it's just a matter of time warping out there towards apoapsis. And as you can see, uh, the uh, waypoint that's on the surface of Kerbin is coming out right underneath where the vessel is going to be coming to apoapsis. Then it's just circularization to finish off this orbital insertion. Okay. Definitely closing in on it now. A little bit more. Oh, there we go. The contract has just gone green. 
But of course, you know, I'm not satisfied with that. I, I'll be uh, continuing to play with this until I get the period as close as I can to six hours because I do want to uh, to get this thing uh, into an orbit in which it will stay pretty much where it is. Uh, relative to Kerbin, of course. Um, and uh, I'll fix the inclination a little bit too, get the inclination as close as I can to zero, but I won't be showing you that because oh, you've seen me do that before. Uh, but what I will be showing you is that here's where I finally realized my silly mistake when it came to that remote tech contract. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have already figured out this issue, but the range on this antenna is 90 megameters. And here we can see Duna, for instance, has, is 13 gigameters away uh yeah 90 megameters is only 90,000 kilometers that's barely out of the Kerbin sphere of influence this antenna is has barely any more range than the deployable dish antennas that you've been seeing me use for a long long time uh yeah and as it, that's just a dumb mistake I do have an antenna that will reach out to these inner planets um yeah just wasn't thinking Anyway, there's nothing left to do but to move on, and we're moving on to uh, Valentina and Chrissy and Glafia coming back from the moon and doing their first arrow breaking pass. Um, I'm taking a little bit easier with my arrow breaking since uh, a few episodes ago, if you might recall, that I lost a couple of deployable solar panels while arrow breaking. So I I'm going through at a little bit of higher altitude than I have in the past. Um, I've been using uh, the trajectories mod and using the g-force prediction as sort of an indication of just how much heating um i do want to emphasize that that actually is really kind of a ballpark guess it really isn't just about g-forces and deceleration a vessel with more mass will carry its velocity more through the atmosphere you know it takes more force to slow it down um so it'll be going through the atmosphere and, and at a higher velocity and slowing down not quite as much so you won't be pulling out that many g's but because it will be going faster uh it will have more heating issues so it's not just about g-forces it's also about mass this vessel has now the extra mass of that lander on it so i am thinking about those kind of things so uh be nice to have some sort of an indication of what the heating is going to be but uh all you can do is sort of guesstimate at it but anyway uh, the pass went without issue of course i go out to apoapsis and i set myself up for my next pass and it was then that i realized that ooh, my inclination my inclination is like 10 degrees now if i was just going to descend to the surface or if i just wanted to go into any kind of orbit then that wouldn't matter but that's not what i want to do i want to rendezvous with a space station that is in an orbit with an inclination of zero so i do have to get rid of this 10 degree inclination and the closer i am to the body the more expensive inclination changes are going to be so i should be doing it when i'm far away now right now i'm about 20 minutes past where my equatorial ascending node was um but i decided you know, I'm going to go for it anyway. I got only 171 meters per second of delta V left in this thing, but uh, I, 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 yeah, I, uh, I, I kind of have to do this. The time to have done this, the right time to have done this, would have been actually during my uh, escape from the moon. Uh, while I was ejecting from the moon, that would have been the time to pay attention to what my resulting inclination, and I wasn't paying enough attention to it then. Um, so I played around with it here, and unfortunately, yeah, I, I ended up, I tried to do it with RCS, and it wasn't going to do it, so I used a bit of fuel. I ended up using up, got down, used about 30 meters per second of delta V, only got my inclination down, down to about 6.5 degrees, and not only that... I messed up my arrow braking maneuver, so I had to readjust that with some RCS. So that ended up being a in, pretty inefficient thing to do. So uh, I, I, the only thing I can think of doing now is to do another arrow braking pass and uh, do my inclination change in the right spot when I really am at the equatorial ascending node. So I was annoyed about that. And frankly, I was still annoyed about that antenna foul up. Uh, earlier in this particular video when I realized, wait a second, I do have the right antenna. I've had the right antenna in space for 25 days. It's sitting on Duna 1. Duna 1 got launched uh, several episodes ago and it's just waiting for the transfer window to be put out towards Duna. All I have to do is turn that thing on and point it somewhere. So there we go. Done. Yeah. So uh, it's going to take a four day shakedown. Oh, 
Oh, that might be a problem. Uh, when <laughs> when is my transfer burn? Okay, Duna one. Oh, that's gonna be in about a day and a half. Okay. <laughs> So four days from now, this thing might be, is probably going to be exiting the Kerbin system. And I do need to maintain a connection, and that's going to be a problem, likely because uh, I might not have an antenna that can reach that far out by then. Because this is the only long-range antenna I got. Well, we'll have to cross that bridge when we get to it, if we get to it. We'll be getting back to Duna 1 next episode, and we'll be getting back to the Karayan a little later in this episode, but uh, just this quick thing just first. A kind viewer pointed out to me, you know, there are more biomes in the Kerbal Space Center than just the various buildings. There's all kinds of really tiny microbiomes that you can get to, and I did not know that. So, like, for instance, right here, this is the flagpole that is at the astronauts' complex, and... It is its own biome, and since I've never been here before, I got the whole array of science that I can collect. And there's a whole bunch of these, and if you want to find them, uh, for your, well, you could search around yourself if you want, kind of scurrying up nice and close to buildings, but you, if you just Google, you know, uh, Kerbal Space Center Biomes Complete List or something, you'll get it right away. Uh, let's see here, maybe there's something up close to the building. Oh, oh yeah, there is something here. Okay, well, why don't we just uh, turn around here and then see if I can nuzzle in nice and close into the building. Oh, just a little bit further. There, there it is. Let's hold that spot. Let's see what it. Oh, this is the R&D main building, and there's actually a, a number of buildings in the R&D center. The the R&D center is rich with with these little mini biomes. Now, I'm pretty sure. Some of these biomes only come on as you upgrade the building. So you have to kind of, as you upgrade buildings, come back and, and sort of take another look. We'll scoop up this science. And uh, let's see if we can get out of here. Wiggle around a little bit. Uh, no. No, unfortunately this thing doesn't have a reverse. <laughs> I would love, I gotta get some rover wheels. I haven't gotten any rover wheels yet. Then I can get an actual proper vehicle. But, uh, oh well. Okay, I can't get out. Let's see if I can get... Uh, Carol out here to push. Oh, oh dear, the uh, hatch is locked or blocked. She can't get out. She can't even get out and push. She's stuck in there. And in fact, no matter what I did, I was stuck. I couldn't get it out of there, so I had to recover. <laughs> this mission ended up getting cut short. But even that aborted mission got me 64 science, bringing me up to 185 science. That allowed me to unlock another node. And I went for actuators because what I want are these infernal robotic parts. Uh, I want to get into some of this infernal robotics part. And I have actually a specific mission that I'll get to into the future. I also have advanced electrics that I unlocked earlier. I just didn't show it to you. And advanced electrics coming up in only a few hours. Actuators is coming up in two and a half days. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll put another science buggy into the building queue as well. And I'll redo that. It only takes a day or so to build this thing. But, uh... Let's get out to the Karayan and uh, see if we can uh, get this into the orbit that I need it to be in. So this is now the second aerobraking pass for the Karayan. Uh, and it went perfectly normally. The thing that's going to be different this time, though, is I'm going to be paying attention and stopping off at my equatorial ascending node. Because this, I'm running out of chances in which to fix this inclination with any degree of efficiency. Yeah, I would love to do as much of this as I can using the monopropellant, but uh, just isn't cutting it. I'm going to have to switch to liquid fuel and oxidizer. There we go. And uh, as painful as it was, I still think this, given my situation, was the best thing for me to do right now is to get my inclination right. And that ended up bringing my remaining delta V down to only 37 meters per second of liquid fuel and oxidizer left. And that brought my inclination down to 0.3 degrees. So that's, that's fine, but uh, not a lot of LFO left at all. Still a lot of monoprop, though, so uh, this isn't lost yet. And I'd like to add, too, uh, the, the crew here really isn't at any any real risk. I mean, any more risk than they are normally when you 
when you put gerbils into space. Um, and the reason for that is because at any point in this process, I have more than enough monoprop to pull my periapsis out of the atmosphere and achieve a stable orbit. They got tons of life support. They are in orbit around Kerbin. Um, I could easily send up a fuel barge or something and fuel these guys back up again. Uh, but this is just, just kind of personal, I suppose. Anyway, after a couple of more arrow breaking passes, I ended up bringing my apoapsis down to 185 kilometers, which is more than adequate. So I decided to uh, push my periapsis out of Kerbin's atmosphere, and I'm using what little remains of my liquid fuel and oxidator. Dizer. Yes, I didn't want to mess around with this particular maneuver. I probably could have done it with monoprop, but uh, I wanted to make sure to get that periapsis out of the atmosphere. That was important for the well-being of my Kerbals. If I mess up the rendezvous, that's not a big deal. But if I mess up this part, yeah, it is. And that left me with 11 meters per second of liquid fuel and oxidizer left. All right, uh, pretty much on fumes there, but... I still do have 82% of the original monoprop that this vessel started with. That's that's quite a lot. And although Kerbal Engineer doesn't show the delta V uh, from the monopropellant, uh, it is not insignificant. So I still have uh, I still have hope <laughs> for this one. And I set up my maneuver to rendezvous with Kerbin Station, and that maneuver is going to cost me 22 meters per second. Uh, and remember, I still got a match velocities on the other side of this particular maneuver, so uh, you're yeah, not out of the woods yet. But that maneuver is not going to occur for another day and a half. So I think I'm going to be drawing this one to a close and have that for the next episode. Yeah, uh, sorry to break it up like this, but this episode I think is coming to its natural conclusion. I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.